again. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming back to the podcast. We've been doing this now for like nine weeks and people are still coming back, Tom. I guess that means they kind of like you and they put up with me. I'm John. That is Tom. Um, oh, oh that's right yeah i'll hold up my card which makes no difference uh, and uh the, i'm tom from asbury and corpus christi that's right and tom today we have we have done something great on the podcast we have uh, taken in our first guest we have with us the uh, reverend the Seymour, john fagans John is a pastor at La Trinidad United Methodist Church in San Antonio, Texas, right off of I-10. You can see it uh, right to you. If you're coming down towards Corpus, you can see it on your right hand as you go. What, that's right before, right? Uh, isn't it close to that? Uh, what is the cafe that? Uh, oh, we're, we're right down the street from UTSA downtown campus on the yeah, west side. The west on the, side. It's oh, okay. actually not on the Corpus Freeway. It's on the Laredo Highway on 30th. Nah, that's right. Okay, that's right. Yes, yes. I'm I'm on my way to Corpus and I connect. So there you go. Yeah, yeah very good. Depends which side of the downtown you take. That's right. John, how long have you been there? Seven years. Seven um, in my years. eighth year of appointment. Wow. Which in United Methodist terms is like almost a lifetime, right? Yeah, it's uh, seven dog years. <laughs> seven dog years. And your wife Raquel serves with you there, right? She does. She uh, became full time this uh, annual conference season. So uh, she had been there part time for a few years, and uh, the church was able to bring her to the full time status this uh, this summer. It's good. Now, there's so many things I want to ask about that uh, that I'm afraid to because we're recording. My wife's talked about, you know, uh, she would love to work at a church. I'll just work at the church where you're at. And I thought, would that be a good thing or not? I don't know. Um, Tom, you have some experience, right? Yeah, actually, my wife was the office manager here for uh, a, a year or two. I, I think it was uh, one year, but and and then there was that possibility that if I got moved and she got moved at the same time, well, we would assume she would have gone with me. Uh, that would have been a uh, created a, an additional stress. But uh, yeah, she did a great job. It really was good having her on staff. Okay. All right. Good. Well. Uh, we're, we're not in that uh, situation yet, so maybe we won't have to deal with that. But uh, anyway, so John, glad you're here. Thanks for uh, Thank uh, accepting the invitation. John's going to talk to us about a project uh, he did in just a few minutes before we get to that, though. Um, have you heard of election stress disorder? <laughs> I have now, yeah. It, it's a real thing, but it's, it's not like a real, real thing. It's it, something that somebody gave a word to that, uh, you know, that we can all feel and sense it. Sometime. I've been suffering post-election stress disorder for the last uh, four years. This is a uh, little, little different, <laughs> little different. <laughs> um, also but, known as post-traumatic stress disorder. Little different. And, uh, <laughs> so the reason why I didn't know about it either, but I came across a, um, a website that uh, mm -hmm. was telling about another website, kind of an Airbnb thing, but the website offers a chance to live under a rock during election week <laughs> this is a man-made cave 50 feet below ground in new mexico and they are offering for the week of the u.s election on hotels.com so get your keyboards ready for customers seeking to live under a rock and escape the news cycle and uh, yeah go look it up it's i mean i think i want to go i'm looking at it um of course when you're 50 feet on the ground um your cell service probably isn't all that great, right? And internet service, so there's a disconnect. So if you need to get away, now, watch this, guys. It's first come, first serve, because there's only one. The five-night stay costs an Abraham Lincoln-inspired $5 per night. Really? I can't even believe that. Um, $5 a night? That's what this says, man. I'm feeling like I need to go before election during election after election like that's where i want to go period i just what, uh, what do they have down there in that place anything well, i'm, look, I'm look, i don't know about what do they, they let you back out i bet they don't <laughs> I, I bet they don't have, yeah i bet they don't have heating and air conditioning i'm looking at the little uh you know there's some you know you sure that's not carlsbad caverns <laughs> yeah, that's right. They just threw some lamps down there and, and some rugs. I see a little bedroom. I don't know, man. I'm like thinking, 
I want to go just to go anyway. Um, where else can you go for five bucks a night? I bet it's cheaper than getting into Carlsbad. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> just vote early and get it over with, and then you don't have to you know, stress early, anymore. Early voting starts tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. You guys, <laughs> have you so, made your... Well, the, I, I could just see this guy going, man, we got a flood of... Uh, of uh, of requests out of Corpus Christi. I wonder what the uh, that's all about. Yeah, because you know that big volume of listeners that we have on our <laughs> podcast, we're just like there streaming everybody there. Yeah, <laughs> your 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 mama, uh, uh, my dad, and uh... <laughs> guys. One of my favorite um, movie lines of all time is from one of the silliest movies. You ever seen Little Giants? Remember that little movie? Uh, I I kind of I don't some know. Of our, some I of know our what, listeners will. I, I, my favorite I'm line is the little guy who says, "Don't be talking about my mama." And uh, anyway, you have to go watch that now for the next for that to make sense. Anyway, so there's your new vacation. Maybe we should tow away before he left. He could have had a could have had cheap stay somewhere. But um, I don't know. I'm kind of interested, man. Just for the sake of saying, I was 50 feet underground in a hotel room. Um, Let's see. We'll share it in the notes so everybody can. It's we're transforming an age-old idiom into a bookable experience so individuals can relax, recharge, and recover. Because who knows what else 2020 has in store for us. Okay. Anyway, so when you need to get away, guys, like is there a place you do go? Is there something you go to do when you just kind of have to, whether it's election stress disorder or any other kind of stress? Is there a place that you go to? You know, uh, and I haven't been there well in over a year, but uh, Leb Shemaya, which is just down the road from us, is a Catholic uh, retreat center. Yeah. And man, I, I always feel re rejuvenated uh, because basically you're there, you eat, you sleep, uh, you walk and pray, you read. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, television or or any they do have uh wi-fi but the wi-fi is in one room uh so uh you know it's 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 fairly limited as to what you can do but what you can do is a lot of walking in my case i, I do a lot of walk in there okay good deal john what do you do well some of the things i like to do are ruled out by the pandemic i my mom lives in Lano and mm -hmm. she has a place just a couple of blocks from the Lano river. We we've, we've had to cut back going to see her because of this. And, but her, her place is real relaxing and a lot of fun because just from her house, you can walk down and walk on the shores and get in the river and swim or kayak. So it's, it's very relaxing. Um, if we've got a little more time, we like to travel in Mexico or New Mexico. And uh, you mentioned New Mexico, but we usually don't, go into the bunker in new mexico but we like to camp uh, camping's a lot of fun good deal and I, I talk to people sometimes it's like you know, when, you know this idea about getting away and you know recharging all that stuff and a lot of times people i feel like i get the impression that since it's coming from me then then that must mean that you know they have to do something you know holy or you know kind of church structured but you know taking the walk right being with your family and those i mean what's what's unholy about that right that tell me God's not there um, or God can't use that time to be a blessing for a family or for Amen. a soul that's feeling depleted, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes we have this idea that, you know, the holy things or the church things and all the other things are kind of uh, in the way. And that's not, that's not always true, that so these are good things we can do. And, you know, that walk could be the most blessed activity of your week if you decide to do it uh, you know, for the glory of God and, you know, to recognize God's presence there. So... Well, can I change my answer then? Because you know, sure. a Catholic retreat center uh, <laughs> that I haven't been to in over a year. No, actually, uh, since the pandemic, I've definitely taken up cycling a lot more and uh, hit the 700 mile mark on Sunday. Yeah, it's funny that uh, I, I did that the 600 on Sunday mo on a Sunday morning and uh, 700 on a Sunday morning. So, but that, uh, you know, that's uh, except for the tense uh, moment of I can't see 15 feet down the, the road and had to cross the street on a, on a major uh, highway because of fog. You know, other than that, it was pretty relaxing just those those few brief moments huh yeah 
Very good. All right, so speaking of uh, hotels and Airbnb, that kind of stuff, uh, see, see what you think about this. Um, he's, this is coming from the New York Times. He's very, very sorry, but the hotel in Thailand that threatened an American guest with prison for his bad reviews may end up with bigger regrets. Wesley Barnes, American guest, publicly apologized on Friday for his blunt online reviews of the Sea View Ko Chang restaurant I'm sorry, resort in Thailand. Uh, are you guys review writers? Yes, but not on a regular basis. Okay. Yeah, I, I was teasing my wife yesterday. We got wings for lunch and long story short, I mean, we had to wait about an hour to get the order. And so when we finally got home, when the food got home, um, we ate and everything. There goes my wife. She's she's on the app and she's like, I'm going to tell them what the hell. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> But in Thailand, apparently, you need to be careful. So um, it is, you can get up to two years of prison time in Thailand for this kind of activity um, because it's it's considered defamation, criminal defamation. Um, and so I, I, really wanted, I really wanted to read you his statement that he gave um, to get out of prison. Uh, let's see, where's it at? <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Barnes, uh, blah, 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 in a statement filled with stilted official language reminiscent of a forced confession, here's what he says. All of the statements that I made are completely untrue. These reviews and comments were written out of anger and malice. Now I, Mr. Barnes, have regretted my actions and would like to apologize to the Seaview Ko Chang and its staff. So all that, guys, if you end up going to New Mexico... <laughs> To the hole, to yes, the to the hole bunker, to the rock. Yeah, be careful because you never know who's who's watching. Um, and he got actually he got out of the two year, but he had already spent two months in prison. This is crazy. I've got <laughs> mine already. Job. He's already there. <laughs> you're you're ready to go, huh? I'm ready for the <laughs> pandemic. Oh, man. <laughs> anyway. There's no spot, man. I got it. I've got it. They got all the. Goodies there ready. What's that green cup, man? I don't know. I don't know. It looks like it has a funny leaf on it, right? Funny leaf, right? <laughs> yeah, a red one and a green one. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, so uh, uh, we want to tell everybody, uh, Wade and Brad are not here today. As you can tell, they are regulars here. Uh, Wade decided he had enough of us, and uh, he's on vacation. Uh, he actually told me he had enough of Tom. But anyway, he's on vacation. <laughs> that he was going to be unavailable all week. So good for him. We're glad he's able to get away. Uh, Brad, on the other hand, is uh, traveling back and forth to San Antonio. His dad is not doing very well. So those of you who are listeners who are part of his church, I'm sure you know what's going on. And uh, anybody else that uh, knows Brad, uh, knows him from the podcast or anything else, make sure to send a prayer for him and his family as they <clears throat> walk through this uh, difficult time. But we said before, John Fagans is here. And John, I asked you to come be a part of our podcast because you started a project uh, last month that uh, I found pretty interesting and just want to give you a chance to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, the project itself, kind of maybe even some of the response you've had and kind of what are the genesis of that project for you and, and some of your experience that went behind it. And, um, you know, we're kind of laid back here. So uh, why don't you tell us what the project is and what mm -hmm. made you decide to begin with it? Well, the uh, thing that prompted me, there were a couple of things that prompted me to write. One was the General Commission on Religion and Race of the UMC put out a 30 days of anti-racism challenge. And it was challenging people to take 30 days the month of September and do something anti-racist um, over that period of time. Um, and we can, t one of the things we need to talk about in this is, is what that means. Uh, the other thing that happened is that within our organization, the United Methodist Church, uh, Raquel and I were struggling against something systemic as well that had to do with honoring some uh, restrictions on a certain fund that helps Hispanic churches. And um, I just thought when I saw the 30 days, I thought, I wonder if I could come up with a list of 30 ways that I have seen the system 
the United Methodist Conference that I've belonged to, either Southwest Texas or Rio, Texas, and briefly Rio Grande Conference, but I've seen the Episcopal area push back against progress on the issue of inclusion of people. Uh, just to give you, so I did a, a 30 days of anti-racism blog on my blog. I have a blog called plenaria.net and um, I decided to write th this list and I got 30 tactics that I've experienced in 25 years of ministry. I entered the conference uh, uh, back in 1995 under my first appointment after graduating from Perkins School of Theology. I was bilingual. I I'd served in Mexico. I did a lot of work. And I'd, I've always been interested in seeing our conference reflect in its membership the demographics of our service area. Uh, we've been watching for years how the Hispanic population has grown, how it's become more diverse, how uh, the schools were the first sign of the change happening. And then now we see it uh, 2041 in the United States as a whole is supposed to be minority Anglo. Uh, but in our part of the world, uh, we serve in an area the south of the, the boundaries of Rio Texas Conference is 60% Hispanic, but 15% of our membership is Hispanic. And that's after the merger. Um, we're, you know, they're the most disproportionately excluded demographic in the life of the church. And, uh, and they're the youngest uh, as well. And they have the families with kids and everything that churches ought to just love to embrace and, and do. And I've been promoting systemic change uh, for my whole career, things that were policy-based that we could do to help us be more effective in that group. And I've seen that while there's pretty good consensus uh, most of the time about personal racism, now let's, to be clear, we got to talk about the difference. Personal racism is what most people think of when they think of racism. They think of that bigot person who mouths off with stereotypes and, and uh, negative attitudes against different racial groups. And that person they know or maybe even love, right? Yeah, they might have been born into a home where that's being done as I was. I was born into a home where racism was taught. And or the racist ideology of white supremacy that, that white people... In, innately genetically or more gov or more uh, predestined to rule the world or to create civilization or to do whatever those are that's an ideological form of racism and then there's the personal animus type of racism when we talk about systemic racism however we're talking about the rules by which organizations govern themselves how they spend money how they budget how they organize themselves how they distribute power and privilege uh, whether it, it a church organization, whether it be society at large, whether it be a school um, that creates racist outcomes or perpetuates the inequities that were caused by racism in the past. So, um, so for example, uh, they, they might legitimize the racism that was already there, the, the social inequity that exists between people of color and Anglo people. Um, so, you know, we, there is very clear evidence of racial tension and bias in our history. Some of those narratives are coming along and being told today. That's, again, that has to do with history. Then there's ideology and then there's personal attitudes. But systemic racism has to do with policy. And just to give you a simple example sure. of this policy in our conference life, we are itinerant, right? Methodist ministers are itinerant ministers. We're supposed to be able to receive an appointment to any church in the annual conference. Go where they send us, right? Right. But we are not expected to have the language gifts to allow us to be able to do that. We are a bilingual conference made up of churches serving a bilingual community, sometimes more than one, more than two languages, but let's just say English and Spanish to begin with. And we're not expected to do that. Um, we just got the consultation forms sent to us just as we're having this meeting. These are the forms that we fill out as pastors, churches fill out to send to the district superintendents to review our appointments every year. Those forms are bilingual by standing rules of the conference. I moved years ago to have bilingual official correspondence. So we have everything 
conference journals and forms and everything bilingual. I, I, I actually was the voice up there after merger to say, let's do this. But ask yourself if a, that's a confidential form between a PPRC and a, and a DS or between a pastor and a DS, and it's a bilingual form. But how many of the members of the cabinet would read it in Spanish? If it was turned in in Spanish, how many of them could, could read or do a consultation in Spanish or meet in an SPRC meeting where the people only speak Spanish and they're talking about their pastoral needs in the church? Uh, that's systemic because the, the, at one level, you have uh, something that appears inclusive and is bilingual, but then at another level, the expectations are not there to, to allow the human resources to follow through. That's a systemic problem. Uh, when we merged uh, the two conferences, I got a hold of the job descriptions of the new conference staff that were organized. And these are all the positions at the annual conference office on Hebner Road. And uh, I got copies of these. And I was shocked. The original version of those forms had in the expectations for employment this statement uh, under job expectations that the person would be fully fluent in English, writing and speaking English. They had to be 100% competent in the English language. And then it said Spanish is a plus but not necessary. Okay, in writing, on job descriptions. That's what we mean by systemic bias. What does that mean? If we hire people that can't communicate in Spanish? Well, it means that we see the kinds of things that keep happening over and over again. A lack of understanding, a lack of communication, uh, and people that aren't served equally to other people and uh, services that aren't held that need to be held. Uh, now, our Articles of Religion in the, in the Book of Discipline says that we're supposed to offer worship in the language that people understand, uh, the language of the people. We can decide, is that our membership or is that the community at large, right, depending on your ministry philosophy. But, but um, so what I decided to do, I'm talking about a few examples so we can understand systemic issues uh, as opposed to personal bias or racism, uh, et cetera. Like I'll, I'll give you a personal bias example. I, I was at a district meeting uh, shortly after being appointed to attorney. I, my district superintendent stands up and refers to my appointment and Gil Paredes's appointment. We were both crossing conference lines to be appointed in the Rio Grande conference. He was going to Divino. I was going to La Trinidad and the DS called them half breed appointments. Okay. That's a racial term. Uh, I found it to be particularly uh, difficult to listen to because my children are of mixed heritage and that's often used against people of mixed uh, ethnic and racial background. And uh, that's personal. That, the fact that a district superintendent said it though, without, with impunity, right. a district superintendent said it and also had other behavior that, that was biased, that makes it systemic. A systemic has to do with power and authority and, and gaming the system so that it, it favors a certain group and is biased against another group. Now, on my list of the 30 things, uh, I've already published about 13 of them. So I'm happy to talk about those here on the blog. The other ones, y'all will have to read them on the blog on plenaria.net as they come out. Um, but just to give you an example, some examples. And the, again, these are things that I've witnessed. These are things that I've seen that have blocked. And just to give you, give you a sense of how serious this is, uh, back in 2002 or three, uh, the Southwest Texas Conference saw data that I prepared that suggested that if we didn't do something very serious to reach the growing Hispanic majority, we were gonna end up in a state of decline across the conference. We were gonna start declining. We were growing back then. And the data showed that was going to stop, that our Anglocentrism, our white bias in the local church, which was clearly showing up in statistical graphs, uh, was going to take us down. And they voted as a conference unanimously to create a comprehensive plan for Hispanic ministry that was supposed to be a systemic plan. Uh, no sooner did that vote pass that yours truly got removed from the leadership of that effort. 
Okay. And what emerged instead was a very non-ambitious little small nothing plan that had a lot of generalities and a lot of values and spoke a lot of stuff, but didn't have any teeth and didn't have any specific policy changes uh, in place. So let's talk, uh, and then that happened again with merger. We had all the rhetoric leading up to merger, and then what do we get at the other side of it? You know, where is it? Um, we, we had a year where the first eight rounds of appointments in the annual conference all went to Anglo clergy, and you didn't see a person of color appointed to a church or introduced in a church until the last half of the appointment process. Those kind of patterns are there. They're in the evidence. And the, the advantage of talking about systemic racism is that you don't have to look at motives. You don't have to look at the individual character of people. Just look at outcomes. And you look at the rules and the incentives and the, the way things are structured and realize we're incentivizing failure uh, on this. So let's talk a little bit about some of these chapters. The first one I talk about is externalization. And externalization happens when the system begins to talk about racism as if it's something out there, not in the church. It's something that happens in police brutality. It's something happening at the border. It's something happening uh, with, with people with tiki torches. It's, it's outside of us. It's not us. It's not our problem. It's not the church, right? When we all know if we're in the ministry that it is in the church, and it's not just at the local level, it's at all levels because the status quo wants to preserve itself. And it's an Anglo dominant status quo. So externalization kind of distracts from that. The other is personal. Second one I wrote about personalization is making racism only into something personal. So saying, for example, this is something we need to work on. We need to get better at listening to each other. We need to learn how to understand each other. It's a psychological issue in individuals that we need to be more nice, more inclusive, et cetera. I want to tell you that the people who benefit most from keeping the system the same, from not sharing privilege, power, money, opportunity with people of color, they, they, not, they don't talk like racists. They don't sound like racists. They don't look like racists. They're, they use the language of inclusiveness because that keeps them in privilege. Okay. So personalization is a mistake because it's, you know, you can benefit from systemic racism without being personally racist. Uh, spotlighting, I, I talk about where we just focus on some one one thing that we're doing and, and again, distract from the system again, distract from what, uh, what's happening. Um, talk about normalization, which is sort of just making things normal. Anglo normativity is part of that. And, and let me give you an example of normalization. When you have a letter go out from the conference that is written in a way that assumes that the entire church is white, that the entire church is on the, bad side of this racism equation that, you know, that's normalization in the book of discipline of UMC. When you read the term racial ethnic person. Okay. Every single time that you see that term, it is not referring to a person of the white race or Anglo ethnicity. Every single time a person of the white race and Anglo ethnicity is never called a racial ethnic person. They are a racial ethnic person, but they're not called that, right? They're normal and everybody else has the label. And that's what normalization is about, right? And that's systemic because it's in the book. It's in the way the book's written. It's in the way that the committees are structured. It's in the way that we categorize people. And, and so I'm going to take just a break here. There's more, there's, there's a lot of these uh, that are all yeah. over the place. I tell you what, for the sake of time, because, John has yeah. a Bible study he does with his church at noon on Monday. We right. record this. John, I'm reading right now The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity and Racism mm -hmm. by Jamar Tisby. I don't know if you've read it or not. But anyway, uh, there's one part when he says that historically speaking, when faced with the choice between racism and equality, the American church has tended to practice a complicit Christianity rather than a courageous Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, my assumption is you agree with that. You would, you would agree with that at some levels, right? I, I would agree. I would need to read the book and find sure. out if it's an overgeneralization or not. 
but sure. yes. Uh, it's a great book. I guess what I wanted to ask you um, before you do get out of here, you know, considering the systemic uh, forms that you've seen experience that you've called out, um, mm -hmm. let's talk about our local churches, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. people who fill those churches, what are they to do with that information? What are they to now feel like uh, they have the power to do uh, with knowing with what you're, you're talking about right now? Very good question. Knowing first that the system above the church is going to put the responsibility on them and take it away from themselves. Okay. So you're going to hear from the cabinet, from the bishop, Everything has got to be localized and, and take, the, take the heat off of themselves and off of their system. So first off, now that's not to say that the local doesn't matter. It matters. But local people need to think in two ways. They need to think, what can we do locally, systemically, to incentivize success in being an inclusive church and being a church that's ethnically inclusive, that's missionary, that reaches the people around us. What can we do to incentivize that locally? That, that's a local question for local policy. But then when they elect delegates to go to annual conference, they need to also think, who can we pick that will go up there and seek reform and call for transparency, accountability, and integrity at that level? What are we going to do to send people up that are conscious about this? How are we going to train and, and wake up our delegates so that they can realize that they're being disenfranchised at the level higher up. Mm. This year's annual conference, you can look at the vote totals, 500 votes, 550 votes. That's half the normal number of votes. Look in the pre-conference journal. The, the most, one of the most important systemic policies there for if inclusiveness is the equitable compensation policy, which is a regressive policy in this conference that is geared to turn down claims in proportion to the inequity suffered by the pastor sent to that appointment. So the worse the appointment is, the less likely you can get help. That's the way the policy is written. And that policy was adopted in 2014 and never again printed or included in a, in a pre-conference journal. It is kept out of that journal so that we cannot criticize it. We can't amend it. We can't fix it. I consider that to be illegal, but it's what it is. And, and we've got to think locally how can we send people up to annual conference? It'll take the conference back for the mission of the church and just not let this kind of stuff keep going. Now, locally speaking, if you have a pastor that's monolingual and you're serving a community that's bilingual, um, that's likely to happen in our itinerancy, hire a secretary or somebody that answers the phone that's bilingual. Don't just have that person hang up. I served a church as an intern as a Perkins intern many years ago, 1994, San Benito, Texas, our secretary got a call from the bishop in Mexico asking for me. She couldn't understand him and she hung up on him. I watched it happen. Okay. That kind of thing is systemic. She's not racist. She just doesn't know how to communicate. Doesn't have the gifts. Isn't qualified for that job and needs to be. So local people can think about local solutions and should, should reflect at the local level of the hiring and the way things are published, the way things are carried. And then at another, and I'm just talking about the bilingual concern. Okay. There's sure. so many others, right? There's so many ways that, that our, our churches are culturally biased one way or another. Um, and sometimes the bias is because other people just don't show up. Uh, you know, I've been amazed at La Trinidad, how this pandemic and moving to online worship has blown the walls off the church and blown up the railroad tracks with Anglo retired ministers affiliating with our church who live out on the West coast now. Right. Whereas in town and locally, you know, it's, it's geography and redlining and, you know, neighborhood segregation. So uh, that's what I would say, John, have local people focus on local solutions, but when they elect delegates, when they send people to annual conference, Get them ready to go there and ask the right questions and, and, and demand change. That'll and, and frankly, I'll say this. If you're an ideologue and you care about this for the sake of justice, for being fair, great. It's easy to prove the case. There's a pragmatic side of this too. We cannot exist into the future 
as a denomination, if our average membership is 57 years old and white in an area where 60%, 70% of the population is non-white and a lot younger and having these kids, it's just not a good formula for our vitality. And inclusiveness, uh, ethnic inclusiveness is, is the lowest hanging fruit there is. That's why the Assemblies of God, half of the churches they start, or more than half of them, are with non-white populations. They have a Hispanic membership percentage in the Assembly of God that's higher than the percent Hispanic in the population of the United States. Go think about that for a second. Okay. And, and ours is, is less than a percent of the, of the U.S. Uh, church membership. So uh, we have just owning that we've had these patterns. And, and of course, where does it come from in the UMC? We're a colonial era church. When you say mainline denomination, you're talking about churches that come back from the colonies, from the colonial time period that were here at the beginning of the founding of the country and are still here. And they carry forward those values and, and those assumptions and those hierarchies and all of that stuff that came with colonialism. These newer denominations don't have that baggage as bad. They don't, right? That's good. Yeah. Uh, John, thank you for your time. Uh, as I was reading this book that I talked about uh, a second ago, uh, you came to mind. I knew you were thank coming you. up. And, That's uh, an honor. I appreciate that, brother. Well, let me, let me share something else from that book that I think uh, is helpful to connect what you're talking about to these ongoing conversations that I think churches need to be having too. It says, history and scripture teaches us that there can be no reconciliation without repentance. Mm -hmm. There can be no repentance without confession, and there can be no confession without truth. Yet all too often Christians and Americans in general try to circumvent the truth-telling process in their haste to arrive at reconciliation. I think part of what you're trying to help us do, John, is tell the truth. Right. And uh, because we can't we can't move to anything greater without first acknowledging the truth. So uh, thank you for helping us do that today. John, I want to get you out of here so you can uh, go lead that Bible study. Um, yeah. Appreciate I'm happy time. to come back if you want me back to that. That'd be, I've that'd be great. Uh, finish writing the book, man. Uh, yeah. when, I first, when I uh, when I first looked at uh, your, your blog, when I saw what you were doing, I thought, okay, he'd probably write a post or something. Before you know it, I mean, I'm like, it's like a thousand words long. Okay, right on. So yeah, you are writing a right. chapter a day. So uh, keep it up, brother. I appreciate it. It could become a book. I mean, I mean, I could end up binding it together as a as a group. I, I would need to do something to make it a, a little more broader in scope than just our physical area. Sure, but sure. it's um, those tactics are there and. Um, they're used to stop progress. Yeah. Well, I would encourage you to do so because like you said, there are other faith uh, traditions that don't have sort of the baggage we do that mm -hmm. I think yeah. they, can, they can learn from uh, mm -hmm. us. And so your truth telling is a part of that. So uh, I encourage you to do so, brother. Again, thank you for the gift of your time. We'll use that as a way to uh, uh, for us to get out of here as well. Uh, Tom, it's always good to see you, brother. I appreciate you. Thanks yeah. for tuning in to the yeah, podcast. Yeah, meet you, Tom. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, to, these guys didn't know each other, so yeah, yeah, it it was very helpful, and and thanks, John, for uh, sharing what you shared. It certainly uh, brings back some memories of my first appointment at Carrizo Springs, Texas, which uh, you know, uh, uh, definitely a white minority in that that community, and yet an all white church. So, and that's when always were you there, brother? Uh, eighty four to eighty seven. Okay. You weren't there during the Rasu Nida and all of that that happened around there. I, I think that happened before I, you yeah, know, bo uh, I, I definitely heard about it because <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that was just a little before. I mean, it was it was fairly recent history is mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, and if it wasn't, it, it felt like it in talking to some of the folks. You see, our podcast is bringing ministers together. It's bringing people to uh 50 foot underground caves and we're just doing all kind of good work here for the body of christ and if you're listening if there's anything you want us to talk about anything you think would be helpful to figure out what a good christian response might be let us know we'd love to be able to talk about that so until we can do so again thanks for tuning in john tom thank you for the gift of your time and we will see you all next time god be with you thanks john <music>